so what did he call us to? Worship and obedience. And that's the thing that you need to take home today. How do we respond? Worship and obedience. All right, let us begin. Uh, we'll begin with a word of prayer here. Apparently, Father, we're about to enter into your word, and so we just pray that you would be in our midst and that you would teach us. Uh, and that uh, when we talk about things like prophecy, that we place the authority on you and, and not on the pastor or the teacher. Uh, but we really want you to be the one teaching us and opening our eyes to things that uh, will be transpiring in the future. And so we just ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, so we're going to be talking about um, a little bit of prophecy. Uh, you know, I think if you were going to take a survey of uh, conservative Christians, uh, I think you would find that there's a lot of people that are starting to believe that we're working towards the end times. Uh, that uh, we're getting... We're either starting the tribulation or we're getting close to it. Now, we, we can't let the little things of losing our freedom and things like that just automatically say, hey, we're, we're in the end times. Uh, people have lost their freedom uh, for thousands of years in different countries. In America, it's not special. Uh, just because we may go through bad times doesn't mean that end time events are being triggered. Uh, but there are seasons, there is a season to the Lord's coming, and we do have to be able to see the season that arrives. Uh, he says that the leaves on the fig tree will blossom, you know, that, that you will be able to know. And, and that's why when we say that a lot of conservative Christians are beginning to feel that way, it's not because of a singular event or some kind of country that's taking over another country or even a world war. What we are seeing is that the church in itself is going through an extreme transformation, but it's not transforming into something good. Uh, the church of what it is today is so different that a grandparent that has passed away uh, would, would not even be able to recognize what is being allowed to be preached in the church today. Uh, and it's hard for us because like a, a frog in a, a boiling pot that's slowly you know, brought from lukewarm to hot, we don't really see the, the differences because we're so used to it. It, it, it just slowly is happening to us. Um, like, like today, you know, 50 years ago, if we didn't come to church in our Sunday best, that would be really weird because, I mean, that's just what one of the norms was. Like, when you go to worship a living God, I don't care if, you, if, je if you're wearing jeans, but that better be your best. You know, your best jeans. You're going to look nice to worship that living God. You know, and that's just one of the things that now it's, God, you know, it's just come, come as you are, comfortable, don't change anything. You know, but so that's why I'm saying the church is so different that we can't even really recognize it. But uh, you take someone from 50 years ago and plop them into a church today, they would not come back to that church. And so uh, I, a lot of people that are, are faithful and, and mostly those that remember what church was like when we were kids, we all believe, because we were taught in Sunday school that the end is gonna be coming and these things, and, and what does that look like? And sin in the church was one of those things. And so uh, to, to say that is, is we do have to start talking and thinking about that maybe we are getting much closer to the beginning of the tribulation or that we've already started it. And so it's important for all of us as Christians to be informed about those things because there will come a time where there's no longer going to be an opportunity to be informed. We're going to be running <laughs> and hiding. And uh, information will be scarce and fellowship will be harder to come by. And so we want to be able to share those things. So uh, what we're going to start talking today about uh, is the repetition of prophecy. 
Um, there are certain books in the Bible that are prophetic books, like Daniel and Ezekiel. I know Todd's been reading some of those lately. Uh, and Revelation is a book of prophecy. Um, and we all know those ones. But the whole of Scripture can be used as prophecy. The Lord will go and He will use any Scripture that He has because it's His living Word, and He will use that to do something in the future. And it's amazing. If, uh, if you read the book of Matthew, Matthew took Mark's Gospel and he, he used that as a skeleton, and then basically he went through the whole Gospel and said, oh, that's a prophecy from here. Here, that's a prophecy. And he brought like 300 prophecies from the Old Testament into Mark's Gospel so that we could see all of the things that were prophesied uh, in the Old Testament that were talking about Jesus and his death and resurrection. To, now, and that's important because as we enter the end times, which are, is another major part of prophecy, the whole Bible is going to be used to make prophecy of what is about to take place. Uh, and the Holy Spirit has to be part of that process and reveal those things to us. Um, and I really think that a lot of the stuff that happens in the New Testament that we don't think of as prophecy will be prophecy for those end times. Uh, and th one of the reasons is, is that God is a faithful God. He basically functions in much of the same way. He doesn't really change. Amen? And so there may be different circumstances throughout history, but we can generally know how the Lord is going to respond. Uh, and we're going to show you an example of that in a little bit. God uses our past to show us our future. Uh, when you look at all the, there's over 300 prophecies that talk about Jesus. They were all pointing of things that happened in the past. But God used those things that happened in the past to show who Jesus was going to be in the future. Does that make sense? And so that's what he does. Prophecy takes things from the past and applies them to the future. Uh, but we have to allow the Holy Spirit to apply his word to future events. And that's where we have to be careful as a church, as pastors, is we have to be very careful when we say, thus saith the Lord. Uh, and, and so, in fact, one of the worst parts about the evangelical church right now is they don't, they don't have a position for prophecy in the church. Uh, the Catholic Church doesn't, the Lutheran Church doesn't, and most even church, evangelical churches don't. And I think this is a mistake. Because if we truly believe that the Bible is a living word of God, then we have to assume that God is going to speak to us, and he's going to share things to different people about what they need to hear. Amen? Amen. And so we have to be able to understand that there still is prophecy. Uh, mostly when we enter the end times, it says that men are going to be dreaming dreams. Uh, and people are just going to have their eyes open to things that haven't been opened before. Uh, could you imagine reading uh, the New Testament as a Christian before Christ died? I mean, it wouldn't make sense at all. Like, why? Who cares that he's dying on a cross? Whatever. But now we've had our eyes opened and understand that all those things had to happen. It's going to be the same way as prophecy for the future. Uh, we may not understand everything yet. But we will, because God is faithful and He's the same. And I really think when we get to heaven and all this future end time stuff comes out and the, the day that, you know, everything, we're going to be like, oh, that makes sense. It, <laughs> it had to be that day. <laughs> yeah, right? I mean, because He's always, this, he's always, He has a plan that's all very neat and orderly. And that's why so many people try and figure it out, right? Because he is that way. But no one knows the day or the hour. All right, so. The end times will look much like what has already taken place in the scriptures. If we truly want to know what the end times will be like, 
We need to prepare ourselves by understanding the prophecies of his return. Uh, so the things that happened in the past, we can use those to understand the future. And I wanted to give you just one example of that. What's that? It's the Ark of the, or the Ark, right? Okay. Um, this is the very first book of the Bible. We have um, this guy building a boat. The boat saves everyone on the boat. Everyone that is not in the boat perishes. Okay. What is that prophecy fulfilling? Who is the boat? Jesus. Jesus is the boat. And that's, that's the prophecy. And uh, everyone that's not in the boat will perish. Okay? In the future, the boat is coming back. Not a physical boat. He doesn't need a boat this time. He says that we are going to meet him in the clouds. So it's going to be a like a Wonder Woman. <laughs> Invisible boat. All right? right? But we're going to meet him in the clouds, and it's the same thing. It's prophecy from the past uh, to the past again, and then there's going to be in the present. He is still the ark. Those that remain in him are going to be saved. It is a consistent prophecy. And so that's what we're going to be looking at. Uh, kind of about the prophecy of Judas because we need to know how to respond to what's taking place this week. I think all of us, uh, did anyone lose any sleep? Like it was that bad, like you just thought about it and couldn't even sleep. Okay, so that's good. So at least we got some sleep this week. Okay, but I think a lot of us had it on our minds. Uh, I know for me as the father of children, uh, I was very concerned about, you know, what's the future going to hold? I mean, these are important things that are going on. And so uh, we're going to read what I feel Jesus wants us to do in response. And this is what I felt that he's kind of told me. And that's all I could do is relate what I feel that he's told me. Uh, and so this first scripture is Matthew 26, 14 through 16. And this is after uh, Judas, uh, well, as he's deciding to betray Jesus. It says, Then one of the twelve, named Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me to betray him to you? And they set out for him thirty pieces of silver. And from then on he looked for a good opportunity to betray Jesus. So what we have here is Judas making the decision to betray Jesus. Now is that a good idea? No. Do you think he made the right choice? No. No. It was a prophecy, so. Alright. Now we can take this story and apply it to what I feel the end times are going to be like. And that's why I feel that we are starting to enter the end times. Before the Lord's second coming, he will be betrayed again by those who sit at his table. He will be betrayed by his church. Now, <laughs> that can't happen, right? It happened with Judas. We've already been warned that someone can be so intimate with Jesus Christ, but yet still make the choice to rebel and to leave. You know, in Acts, it says that Judas was marked as one with them. And what that means is that he was fully with Christ. Like he, was, he was in a right relationship with Jesus Christ. I think there's so many churches that want to point out that Judas was never Christian. That he never believed in Jesus. And it's simply not true. He was there for three years under his teaching. But there came a time where Judas chose something outside of Christ. And that led to his destruction. 
And so that's what, uh, what I feel this prophecy is, is that his church will turn on him. Not his whole church, but people that are marked as in the church. Those who betray the Lord will care more about money and influence rather than submission and obedience. And this is something that every church has struggled with throughout history. Uh, everyone wants power. Everyone wants money and influence. It's just kind of who we are. Who wants to be the best? Right? We all want to be the best. It's okay. Right? And sometimes that can come out even in church. Right? Uh, but that kind of leads us into this next part here. A change of expectations will be the trigger point for betrayal. Uh, and this is what happened with Judas, and it's what happens with all of us. Uh, when we come to Jesus, Jesus is amazing. Jesus sets us free. He makes us feel hope and love. But there comes a point when we want Jesus to do something, and he doesn't do it because he's got different plans that are greater than ours, and we don't understand them. And our expectations are blown out of the water. Uh, on an individual level, this can happen when one of our friends uh, doesn't get healed when we pray for them. We say, God, this servant of, of yours has been super faithful. Why in the world haven't you healed him? And we run into expectation issues when those things don't happen. Has that ever happened with someone that you know? where God didn't do something that they expected, and then they, they didn't believe as much. Uh, it really happens a lot when people pass away. Uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but we are all going to pass away unless Jesus comes back. Uh, it might happen this week, it might happen in 100 years. Well, not most of us for 100 years. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but a change of expectations is hard for people to understand. And so picture Judas. He was what we call the zealot. And he wanted Jesus to come in and to kick the Romans out because Jesus is going to be the king of kings. Okay? And they sang it. He's the king of kings. That's what the Messiah is. Like every knee will bow, every tongue confess that he is Lord, right? And so the expectation of Judas and so many other of his believers was that Jesus was going to come in and he was going to kick those Romans out. And what happened was, was Jesus came in and he submitted. And he came under the authority of the Romans. He didn't do anything to the Romans. And so when our expectations change... It causes major struggles and tug of wars in our souls. And I want to tell you that the church in general has had the wrong expectations about what Jesus wants to do. Um, there's a, a, a group that, that uh, speaks a, a lot of tongues and does a lot of the, the signs and wonders type of stuff. They have expectations that are not of God's expectations. They have the seven hill mandate or something like that, where they want to, uh, Jesus has sent them to conquer every aspect of the community, uh, from cultural, uh, entertainment, uh, industrial, I mean, everything. Uh, and it's the sevenfold mandate or, or the fivefold, I don't know what it is. But that's not the expectation that Jesus has, amen? He's not here. For Christians to just spread over the world and have a Christian world. Because our kingdom is not of this world. Our kingdom is of something else. Something that the world can't get to or see. And so there's a change of expectations. And we're beginning to see that these churches who are, are, are realizing that Jesus isn't going to do what they want him to do. And so they are starting to really not believe anymore. They want a different Jesus, and they're going to create a different Jesus. Judas was paid with 30 pieces of silver. 
the church that starts to come against the Christ is going to be paid with immorality. Immorality is something that many men and women want. Who wouldn't want to be able to be immoral and still be Christian? And it's one of the things that everyone, uh, that the Bible is totally against all through Scripture. Uh, in fact, in the New Testament, uh, when uh, the Gentiles finally get accepted into the church, the, the Jews all got together and they were like, well, what are we going to make these Romans do? Are we going to circumcise them all? And they're like, no, that's bad. Okay, well, what are we going to make them do? And they only gave them like four things. Like if you do these four things, you're going to be accepted into the kingdom of God as a Gentile. And one of those four was sexual immorality. And it was idol worship and blood. Refraining from eating blood. Isn't that weird that that was one of the four? <laughs> okay, but there's a lot of theology behind that. Uh, and so immorality is the price that they have accepted to receive. And with that price, we are seeing an entire church that is all of a sudden accepted that immorality is okay. Uh, if we were to, to ask the pastors in this town, we would probably have at least 40% of the churches that would come back and say that sexual immorality is okay. Uh, and more will come in the next couple years. Uh, there's a, another big, huge General Assembly for the Methodists coming up, and they're projected to do the same thing. But, um, and so it is that. Uh, but that is the cost of their immorality. Uh, before the end comes, those that have betrayed the Lord, just like Judas, will understand what they have done, and it will destroy what remains of their faith rather than lead them to repentance. I'm sure that there will be some that repent, but in general, um, Judas knew Jesus really well. Do you think he knew that Jesus would have forgave him? I think so. I mean, he watched Jesus forgive people all the time. But there's just there's something that's going to go so far that they just won't repent. And that's why in Revelation we see so many times that it says God did these and they still didn't repent. And so that's why we have to help those that are coming out of the church. Because I, there will be those that do. Alright? Uh, like Peter, we can never be arrogant enough to think that we are above the temptation to deny Christ. Uh, and so we can never get to the point where we say, this church is the safe church. Right? We all want to say that. Like, we're okay because we're all here. No. None of us are above that reproach. Uh, and that's why we have to examine our own hearts and make sure that we're doing worship. And what was the other one? Obedience. Obedience. And therefore, it doesn't matter what church you go to, because there's only one church in Christ, as long as you're doing worship and obedience, you're going to be just fine. All right. The temptations in the last day. Uh, this is Matthew 26, 39 through 41. Uh, so here, uh, Jesus is about to be taken. Uh, it, it's the boiling point, like the anxiety is there, right? And you'd think that his disciples would be like ready, but that's not what we're going to find. Uh, and so let's look at this. It says, And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So you men could not keep watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying so that you do not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, what I, what I feel is that this, too, is a prophecy for the end times. And so I wanted to share what I feel God has revealed to me about it. 
the Lord now finds his church asleep during the time that he requires our service the most. Um, and I think asleep is the best term that describes our church today. I think it's been that way for a long time. Uh, we've gotten comfortable doing all the different programs. Uh, we go there, we do the programs, we go home, we try and live a pretty good life. Uh, there's no fire, there's no, no passion. It's, uh, evangelism is really dead in, in most churches. I, I think most churches, once they get established, they end up winning like less than three people to Christ and probably like one that doesn't go to their church. Like it's bringing up the kids. Like, oh, the kids came. Ooh, we got another one. No, they're part of your family. Um, but yeah, the church is asleep today. And I think the church is waking up. But we're waking up late. Right? That's what it feels like. Like we're, we're waking up and there's so much that's already taken place that we have to have this major reform for any real health to take place. Uh, he warns us that the time has come for his season of return. Okay, Jesus knew that they were coming to get him that night. Do you know that? He knew. That's why he was, he was probably more amped than they were. They were probably just like they had their Passover meal. They had too much turkey or whatever it was. And they were kind of decided, like, okay, we had a really good conversation. I'm just going to chill, right? But for him, he knew what was happening. And he knows what's happening. Uh, and he warns us that the season of return is coming. Look around. The global church as a whole is being shaken by the Spirit of God. And those who don't really believe are leaving the church by the millions. Uh, last year, a third of the evangelical church walked away and did no longer attend church. That is a serious blow. Uh, we've been in one week in January 2021. And there has been a, yet another serious blow that is going to drive people out of the church. If someone doesn't have a really good reason to be at church, they have a very good excuse to walk away. Does that make sense? And they're going to. Uh, who knows what the church will look like at the end of this year. Uh, it, it's scary to think about. But this is what he commanded those that were next to him as he was preparing. He said, do what? He said, observe, or he, he said, watch and pray. And really what that means is observe and report if you're a military guy. Okay? You're observing, you're seeing what's going on, and you're reporting. You're communicating, you're praying with God. He calls us to be messengers. And, and here's the bad part. We all want to be Rambo. Has anyone seen Rambo? You don't have to raise your hand because you're not supposed to see Rambo. This is right here. Okay, most of us have seen Rambo. I saw it when I was 18. Because I couldn't watch Rated R movies before then. I, I got rented like 12 of them. <laughs> <laughs> it was like blood sport, Rambo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was so bad. That was my rebellion. Yeah. Me too. All right. Okay. There's that many movies and I can't watch them until they're all years old. I know, right? That's just sad. Okay, but the, the truth is, is that God is calling us to observe and to report. And we want to drive a tank towards the enemy and blow stuff up. Right? I mean, who didn't want to jump out of their chair and start walking towards Washington this week? Just a little bit. Uh, like, hey, let's do something. Let's, I mean, let's just hold hands, hold a sign or something. Something! I want to do something. Right? Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> but he calls us to observe and report. Man, that's hard. I pray. Uh, and we are faced with a choice. We can follow the leading of the Spirit or allow temptation to control the weakness of our flesh. And, and look at the end of that. He says, keep watching and praying so that. There's a reason, he says. He says, so that 
you do not come into temptation. All of us want to act, but he isn't calling us to act. And if we, if we act on those urges and those expectations that are coming from what we think Jesus should be doing, what's going to end up happening is we're going to take out our sword, the sword of Christ, and we're going to end up falling on it. And we're going to become casualties of our own sword because it's going to be used against us. If we aren't following the orders of our king, we become enemies of our king. Does that make sense? And so we have to be able to submit and do what God wants us to do and not just do what we want to do. All right. So the question is, what does God want us to do? Well, observe and report, right? And But this is the response. This is what God calls us to do. Okay? Uh, and this is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, 2 through 8. He says this, For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God. Do you want to know what the will of God is for your life? It's pretty direct when he says, This is the will of God. So you can't really argue with it, right? This is what he wants for you. Your sanctification. Sanctification means holiness, righteousness, purity. Uh, that is that you abstain from sexual immorality. Well, that's pretty pointed towards the thing that the church is accepting right now. Okay? He's saying the opposite. This is, your, this is what God wants you to do. Abstain from sexual immorality. That each of you know how to possess his own body. That's what a vessel is. His own body. In sanctification and honor. Not in lustful passion, like the Gentiles who do not know God. And that no one violate the rights and take advantage of his brothers or sisters in this matter. Because the Lord is the avenger in all things. Just as we are also told that you previously and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in sanctification. Therefore, the one who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now, after reading that, do you think immorality is important to God? It's very important to God. And it needs to be important to us. And immorality isn't just acting on urges. Okay? Jesus makes it clear that it's a heart thing. Our thoughts are very important. And so we have to be careful as Christians that we don't point fingers to actions that we see, but don't point our fingers back at ourselves if our thoughts aren't pure. Okay? All right. Sanctification and immorality are complete opposites to a holy God. And we have to understand this. And this is why the issue of the homosexual pastor and the acceptance of things like the LGBT community are so important to conservative Christians. It's not just because we're Republicans and we have to have a different stance than Democrats. Okay, And there are some Democrats that are here, there could be some Democrats in here. That's great. Okay, But when we look at the scriptures, we have to put our party aside, and we have to be willing to look at what God is trying to teach us. Because when we get to heaven, there's no Democrats, there's no Republicans. And what he is saying is that se sexual immorality or any immorality is the total opposite of holy. And it's only if we strive to be holy that we will see God. Amen? And so if God is saying, don't do this, this is not going to get you here, I want you to see me, do it this way. We have to be willing to follow that truth. And we can't change the scriptures. And that's what the churches are doing now. The Bibles are changing, so you don't even have to read that word anymore. Yeah, immorality, that's too much. We're going to change it to something else. Okay? 
All right, uh, two. What does it mean to violate the rights of our brothers and sisters? Take away their freedom. Yeah, I'll take away their freedom. And what this is talking about is, um, well, who here's ever dated before? If you were to go back through your dating history, did you honor God or did you cause other people to be immoral uh, in thought or action by what you did? Uh, and so we have to be careful with that. Uh, and we have to be careful as we enter these end times because, like I said, uh, never before has it been so politically acceptable for a guy to meet a girl and uh, to try things out before they get married. That's just what happens these days. But it's the total opposite of what God calls us to do. And we as parents need to make sure that our children know the, the gamble that they take. Not only the sin, because it is a sin, and every sin haunts and, and affects you, um, especially sexual sin. Amen? Sexual sin is one of the sins that affects people the most because it's one of the only sins that you do to your own body directly. Um, and it's things that you can't take back. The things that you do or, or the choices you make, you can't get those back. They're just there, and you have to live with them. Um, but uh, to violate others, uh, I hope that my sons, they realize that when they are dating another girl, uh, that they that girl is not theirs. It's going to be some other person's unless they marry them. And that they are not to violate their purity and their holiness. We're not to cause other people to sin and to stumble. Amen? Amen. Now, and for us guys and girls, we need to take that as a heart thing as well. Okay? There's uh, a way that you can uh, open up a magic box I call them the magic boxes. Okay, we all know what those are. <laughs> you can open up a magic box and, and go anywhere in the world and see anything that you want to see. Do we know what I'm getting at? And when you see those things that you're not supposed to see, you are taking advantage of the person that you are watching. It's not that, it, I mean, it hurts you, but you are also hurting that person. Okay? All right. <clears throat> Number three, lust is a matter of the heart. Uh, as a young person, lust is really hard to deal with. And it could be one of the toughest struggles that you have until you get older and then you're just too tired. <laughs> There's just other things of life that, that are more important, like playing board games. <laughs> no, I, uh, like this whole last week, we've been playing this board game that takes like nine hours, right? So, I mean, like, I'm all excited about it. I'm not even thinking about anything else. Like, it's a board game. You know? So, yes, things get better as you get older. <laughs> well, I got too old. It would be funny if during that game someone didn't start to understand the world and they were still asking questions during the game. Mm -hmm. oh, 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 oh. Again, it's like too often, I'll like, yeah. I think I woke up dreaming about the game. Next <laughs> I did too. What, what I was going to be doing oh, next. Because, I mean, the game is still there. We're going to go home. The game is there because we're playing a second time. And it's going much faster this time. But Landon, he is just destroying us because Hunter is his ally. And Hunter is giving him all this stuff. And me and Mom are like, come kill Landon. <laughs> So anyway, so things get better. But lust is a matter of the heart, and it is a problem that is a lifelong problem. And it's something that you have to control. Um, I, think it's, I think it's a thing that causes shame more than anything in the world. It a, because it's a secret sin, yes. and I feel like the devil can use it more toward, you know, um, use that shame and that secret to manipulate. manipulate. More than any other, um, so is more I don't know if that makes 
Oh, definitely. Uh, and for me, for my personal life, I struggled with lust when I was a teenager. And uh, I went to a church that was perfect on the outside. Uh, they have a focus on holiness, just like I do. I preach holiness. Uh, but for them, uh, you had to be perfect if you wanted any influence or power in the church. And so that means you couldn't share anything that you were struggling with, ever. And so the effect that that had on me as a Christian and growing up is that I felt like I was broken somehow because I was going to church, I loved Jesus, but I was struggling with lust a lot. And so if there's anyone here that's struggling with lust or if you're growing uh, as a child into a, a man or woman, uh, you need to know that you can't keep those things secret. Because if you keep them secret, Satan will have the power, and this is what he does. Uh, you will do something that's bad, and it'll be small, that, that deals with lust. And he will take that and he'll see, see how, how ugly you are, gross you are, you're not perfect, uh, you might as well give in to this because you've already done this and it's bad. And then what that does is because it's a secret and you haven't told anyone and, and you believe this, you go and you do the next thing that's just a little bit bigger and a little bit badder. And that continues. And every time you want to change and, and break free of those things and, and be righteous before God, Satan just dangles it in front of you again. Look at all the horror. And you get worse. It seems like every passing month, you're a worse of a person that, that doesn't deserve anything. You, that you, you can't possibly be a good Christian anymore. And so that's why it's so important when we deal with things like lust that we have people in our lives that we can talk to. Uh, and so if you're a teenager in here at all, or if you're a young, young person and you're struggling with that, uh, I want you to know that uh, Christina is a great person if you're a girl that you can talk to those things about. Uh, and she is, uh, because she's a pastor's wife, she's a minister, that she would keep those things in confidence of those struggles that you have. Uh, just like me. Uh, if you come to me and you tell me the struggles that you're having, uh, you do not have to worry about me saying, oh my gosh, you're a horrible person. Okay, Because I would have to say that about myself. Uh, lust was one of the... the the biggest strongholds that was in my life. Uh, and it stopped me from following Jesus for a long time. Uh, and I wasn't able to share it with anyone. No one. Even when I was going into ministry, the thing I heard from my, my district superintendent was, if you struggle with lust, you're going to be out of that church. You're not going to be a pastor anymore. How does that help a pastor who's struggling with lust? It means that the pastor can't talk about it and it has to keep it secret and has to deal with it all by himself. And so I, I want you to know that uh, anytime that you're struggling with those things, don't keep it a secret. Talk to someone about it and you'll be able to overcome those things. Very important. All right. Uh, do you stop being tempted when you become Christian? No. No. Okay. Is it okay to struggle with sin? Yes. Yes. You will struggle with sin from now until Jesus takes you back. Okay? The cool part is, is once you overcome one thing, one ugly pimple that you've got, he's going to show you a mole on the other side of your face. And then you're going to struggle with that sin. And then you're going to overcome that, and he's going to show you your back. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just a continuous process of he's going to identify sin, and then you're going to submit that to them and struggle with it. Sometimes it's not always where you just immediately overcome sin. Amen? Amen. Sometimes that struggle is a year, multi-year struggle. Uh, but eventually, the big ugly scars and, and deformities go away. And when you become a real mature Christian, when you get older, he's working on little tiny wrinkles here and there. But it's still important that you're not rebelling. Okay? All right. Uh, all right. So we're going to go on from there. Uh, for if sanctification is what is required for true intimacy with God, and that's what it is. If you want to be with God, you have to be holy. He says, be holy as I am holy. He's made a way for us to be holy, and he expects us to do that. Uh, and so we, if we are required to be holy, and immorality 
and lust, things of that nature, are the things that separate us from sanctification and holiness, what are we willing to give up to be with God? Now, I, I'm talking about lust today because lust was a big thing in my past. And it's something that will always be there. Uh, there are seasons that I go through where lust flares up and I have to put it out with a fire. Even with, because I'm older. And it's something that will always, because we're always tempted, amen? But what are we willing to give up? Okay? Uh, and here's just some little things. And, and these are not uh, laws that everyone has to do. These are things that, that we have to realize could be potential for causing these things. Okay? Uh, who here has Facebook? You know, Facebook can have some of the beautifulest women on there with not that many clothes on. Are we supposed to be looking at that stuff? No. Now, as a Christian, I can do my best to clear out as many advertisements as I can, but yet they keep on popping up. It just happens. Okay? If you're a man, it's going to happen more because they target you with women for advertising. Okay? A lot of women, they, their Facebook's probably like bowls and pottery and I don't know what's on there, but... <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, if they're selling us a muffler or a screwdriver, it's being held by a beautiful woman on top of a car. Okay? Um, and that's just the way it is. Um, and so we have to know that if, if Facebook is causing us to sin, and it, we can't control that, or, or uh, the apps that we have, the Snapchats, the, the videos that we can share with each other. TikTok. TikTok. Do you think Christians are supposed to watch girls dance around? Not really. It doesn't really help us get more holy, amen? Now, a lot of people would say it would be harmless. The world would say it's harmless. But is it harmless? Video games. Uh, I'm going to go back to Facebook. You know, Facebook has tons of advertisements for games because I play a lot of games. Not video games anymore, I have board games. But I get advertisements for board games, I get advertisements for video games. And it doesn't matter what the video game is, they always advertise it with this crazy cartoonish girl that has crazy proportions. I don't know if you've seen those on, on your stuff, but it's like that, it's everywhere. There might not be, it might be like this little dot going from this side to this side of the screen, but in the advertisement, it's this girl with this dot. You know, and the girl's not even in the game, but they're advertising it like that. Okay? And so we have to know that, that video games, a lot of them are getting horrible. It could be a first person shooter. It could be Fortnite. You know, Fortnite has some crazy avatars on there that really don't glorify God. But yeah, we still use them. Okay? Uh, TV shows. Uh, <laughs> uh, shows like Arrow. Have you ever seen Arrow? Where uh, every episode, they have to show his abs, at least for 30 seconds. Like his exercise episode. <laughs> Shirtless ab wonder. Okay? <laughs> you know, right? I mean, strange. But that's what shows do. Our TV shows lust and sexuality. And so, as adults, we have to decide how much of that do we really want in our lives. And the crazy part is, if we're really getting towards the end of days, are we supposed to just continue doing what we're doing, or are we going to add some more safeguards and start taking our faith more seriously? Because there's only one thing that we're required to do. We're required to what? Obey. Worship and obey. That's what's going to get us through. Now what's the world's job? To distract <laughs> and, and uh, tell us that we can do what we want. Okay? Uh, the clothes we choose to wear. Uh, it was like five years ago, leggings became like the main thing that girls seem to wear nowadays. Leggings for guys? I don't care who you are. It's... <laughs> It's like wearing nylons for guys. How would you know 
Unless they're not. <laughs> <I'm just saying. laughs> when a girl shows the curvature of her thighs and her her just everywhere down there, okay? It causes lust in men. It just does. Because we are we're built to be visual. Like if girls weren't beautiful, guys would never be in families. Okay? We would just go build stuff and hunt and fish. Right? <laughs> God made girls beautiful, okay? But we're not supposed to see that, okay? Uh, and so we, uh, as men and as women, we have to be able to really take to heart what we put on our bodies as Christians because we are not supposed to cause other people to sin and to lust over us, okay? It's hard enough if you're trying to abstain from lust and you're in high school, you know, and you're a teenager, and, and all you see is leggings everywhere and holy jeans where you get to see, like, pretty much their whole leg because there's 150 holes in there. I don't even know what that... That's the dorkiest fad ever. <laughs> okay? Okay. No, when I had a hole, I was very unpopular, and then my mom put a patch in it. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> and that was really unpopular. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> patches are probably cool now. These patches like every one of those hundred holes. Like, some grandma got a hold of their jeans like, I got this. <laughs> you know, like, what are you doing? But then you end up. You know? I, I have a bad example. Yeah. All right. So. <laughs> what we choose to wear, and, and I think we all need to we all need to think about that. I think uh, some of us are really good at that. Some of us, maybe we've forgotten, and we've just gone with the fads. You know, we need to be uh, acknowledging of that. Okay, uh, and then this one isn't a law or anything, but the makeup we put on our face. Okay, um, I've always told Christina, I don't care if she wears makeup at all. I love her. No matter if I see wrinkles or anything like that. And so when she puts makeup on, why does she put makeup on? Does she put makeup on to make uh, for me so that I, I that she looks more beautiful for me? Or is she putting makeup on so that she looks more beautiful for everyone else that sees her? And if that's the case, then, then what does that say? You know, and there's a difference between putting on a little makeup just to hide some of the stuff or putting on the makeup so that you look like Lady Gaga or something, okay? And there's a difference, right? There's, there's makeup and then there's makeup, right? Are you, are, are you spending an hour in the bathroom just on your makeup and your hair, you know? And, and that's for guys too, you know? You can spend a whole hour and a half on the do. Right? Go ahead. So what do you want to have? A Tammy Baker face? Tammy Baker face? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just saying as Christians, we have to be careful of the reasons why, who, who is putting in our ear that we have to look super hyper beautiful to other people when we walk around town? Is, is Jesus telling us that? He's not. So we have to be careful with that. All right, so I've covered a lot of weird things like that. Okay, um, here's the response to, the, to Judas' betrayal. Uh, and, and this was the actual message that I received from God today or this week. Uh, I struggled all week. Um, things were taking place. Uh, there was so much propaganda. There was so much anger uh, online and with people and fear. And I just, God just wasn't giving me anything to preach on. Uh, and then it was just yesterday, he just gave me this scripture. And uh, so this is, is what we're going to read. It says, And behold, one of those who were with Jesus reached and drew his sword. Isn't that what we want to do? I mean, Christianity is, is really under attack in America. We want to draw our sword. And struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. 
Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take up the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you not think that I cannot appeal to my Father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? How then would the scriptures be fulfilled, which saith that it must happen this way? All right. As we face the fall of the church, uh, and I hope that's one thing that you believe, uh, because I will teach that. I firmly believe that the church must fall. Uh, and, and so if you struggle with that, it's okay. You don't have to just blindly accept that. Uh, but, but that's what I feel that God has revealed to me in the book of Revelation, that the church, the organization of religion must fall. Uh, it's not perishable. And everything that's, that's perishable must be made imperishable. And that's why we jokingly can say there's not going to be any Baptists in heaven. Amen? There's only going to be those that are in Christ. Uh, but when does that happen? Maybe God wants that to happen before He comes and takes us. Will we still want to do that if our expectations change and our denomination isn't in glory when that happens? Okay? Uh, as we face the fall of the church and the betrayal of those from within it, we will feel the urge to defend and to protect our Lord and Savior by taking up our swords. I felt that way this week. I, I just was like, what can we do? I want to do something. Okay? What we need to realize is that Jesus needs the church to fall for his own people to betray him in order for the fullness of his wrath and the deliverance, and so that the deliverance of his people can take place. Uh, we, we can't fight with prophecy the things that are written about will have to take place before Jesus comes back. Uh, and that's why it's called tribulation. The tribulation is going to be a horrible time. And that's why God says that he's going to keep it short. Amen? It's going to be so hard for strong Christians to remain faithful to Jesus Christ and to continue to live in holiness and to worship him. Uh, but he needs these things to take place. And so we, we have to be careful that we don't go on the other side to try and save what he is deemed as ready to fall. Does that make sense? That doesn't mean we help it fall or push it over, but it means that we continue to do what God has called us to do. Because if God wants the church to fall, who's going to be able to stop? No. No. All right, number three. We need to have faith that God is powerful enough to defend his own kingdom. Amen? If God doesn't want the Lutheran church or the Catholic church to fall, he's going to keep it up. Okay? Uh, and he'll call people to do that. And if we choose to act outside of his will under our own power, we may end up falling on our own sword. Uh, number four. Our call in the end of days is not to fight for Christ. That's what our urge is. We all want to respond that way. It is and will always be to obey His commands and to strive for holiness in our lives. We just spent a whole bunch of time talking about lust. If we want to help the Lord fight for America, we need to fight to take back our own hearts. Does that make sense? Because a hypocritical church that preaches holiness but allows sin to remain in their hearts is one that is void of power and of Christ. And so if we really want to work to fight for this nation, we need to fight for our hearts. Okay? And it's in this that we will find our peace and our hope as it doesn't matter what takes place in this world because we are not of this world. Amen? All right. Therefore, let us watch, let us pray, and let us be ready. The Lord is coming soon.
Let us pray. Uh, I'll pray and then we'll end in the Lord's Prayer. Uh, dear Father, we come to you today, and Lord, none of us are excited to hear the things that you are called us to change in our personal lives. And Lord, the reason is because it's our life. And I want to be able to watch what I want to watch. I want to be able to do what I want to do. I want to spend money on the things that I want to spend money on. But all those things seem to contradict and go against what you want. And so, Lord, I pray that you come into my life, that you continue to reveal what holiness looks like, and that you can give me the courage and empower each one of us to first know that it's worth what we sacrifice in this life. And second, that you will empower us to do those things. Lord, we can't do them on our own. We can't overcome lust on our own. But Lord, we can overcome temptation through you. And every time, every single time that we overcome temptation, we get to rejoice. Because without you in our hearts, without you still being in there, there is absolutely no way under this sun that we could uh, refute or abstain or overcome a temptation. And so, Lord, every time that we do overcome, in every instance, maybe it's a, an advertisement that comes and we avert our eyes, we get to rejoice knowing that it is you in us doing those things. And so we cling to that hope that you are restoring your people and that you love us so much that you are going to destroy all of sin so that we don't have to avert our eyes anymore. That we will come to a time where sin and death has been swallowed up in victory. And Lord, you give us a promise that those who enter this time of great tribulation. They're not going to stay in the ground. They are going to be, they are going to spend a thousand years in a Sabbath rest with you. And Lord, they deserve it because they are about to go through the toughest thing that any Christians have ever had to face as the church is turned on its head and betrays the Lord Jesus Christ. And those that are willing to observe and to pray and worship you in obedience. You will deliver them, just like you delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Lord, give us that courage. Let us pray for our nation. And let us be lights to this world as we work on our own hearts so that we can shine brightly to a darkened world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.